Good afternoon and welcome to today's Center for Studies in Higher Education lecture, which we focus, as you know, on important emerging issues that is research being done on the issue in higher education. Today, we are focused on the issue of financial management higher education institutions, which is an urgent issue, as you know. We have our, a distinguished speaker, Jane Shulman, who has just published a book on this subject entitled The Synthetic University, published by Princeton University Press. Mr. Shulman is Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the American Council of Learned Societies. And along with Mr. Shulman is Jim Hyatt, who will raise questions after the initial presentation. And Jim has extensive experience in management of higher education uh, finances. He's been the senior level financial executive at a number of the nation's major research institutions, including UC Berkeley, the University of Maryland at College Park, the University of Arizona, and Virginia Tech. And Jim is also Senior Research Associate at the Center for Studies in Higher Education and Vice Chancellor Emeritus here at UC Berkeley. Now, Jim and Jane, please begin. And Jane, thank you. Jane thank squared. You. <laughs> thank you, Margaret. Okay, I just want to say a few words about the format we're going to use here. First, we'll hear from James and uh, discuss his book. Then we'll uh, have questions that were received in advance. We asked for people that had questions when we were promoting the session, so we'll do those. And then we'll open in the floor for questions from the audience. So, James, you can begin. So, uh, first and foremost, uh, I'm so appreciative of the Center for hosting me today and Margaret and Jim and your colleagues. Um, it's, it's great to be at one of the world's great institutions and to see how many people uh, in person and online are interested in, in thinking about higher education. You know, it always does strike me uh, as surprising how few academics uh, turn their analytic lens on the institutions around them uh, that, that not only uh, materially advance their lives and through which they move through in their in their work, but uh, but that fosters and over you know is the overarching uh, sort of locus for their things that they care about so passionately. And yet, it, and they know it's a big complex institution. I mean, University of California maybe more so than others. But um, but when scholars actually think about higher education, it's really interesting. Right? It's really interesting. And so it's really wonderful. The more uh, I, I grew up uh, in my intellectual life with, with Bill Bowen, who's an economist, a labor economist, president of the Mellon Foundation. And uh, I have a lot of his uh, sort of intellectual DNA in, in my work. Um, and I, I learned so much and appreciate so much how he thought of the enterprise as something worthy of study. And he encouraged that. Uh, some of the economists at, at Williams, Mike McPherson, Morty Shapiro, Gordon Winston, Cappy Hill, people like that. Uh, Mellon supported um, Ron Ehrenberg at Cornell. And, and uh, you know, throughout the, um, the social sciences and organizational theory and even and the humanities, uh, understanding this enterprise that we're all part of is, is worthy of our time, worthy of our time. So um, I'm just going to say a few things about the book to try to, um, you know, give you a, some sense of what it's about. And then Jim and I are, are going to have dialogue and, and with all of you. And, and I hope the people online are uh, able to uh, send in questions, too. So the synthetic in the title, people might uh, uh, start by wondering about. Um, uh, synthetic biology 
is, uh, is the field where uh, human intervention in uh, complex biological systems, uh, uh, they call it synthetic biology. And in data, some of you know that if you don't have enough data to do the work that you want to do, you synthetically create data based on the data that you have and you know, and then the sort of trends and the, you know, the implications of the data that exists to create a fuller data set. Um, you know, synthetic often strikes people as meaning fake, right? Like a, you know, synthetic fur, right? So, which is better than real fur for a lot of us who don't really believe in that. Synthetic skin, when you, uh, when you, you know, and obviously burn units, you know, thinking about how to synthesize skin. It's not real, right? But it might be useful, right? I, I'm wearing a, 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 a wool jacket, right? I didn't run out to buy a rayon jacket for today. And yet rayon has a real purpose and does some things really well, you know, and more growth. So th there's there's an element of compromise in, in the title of this work. And so what I'm really writing about is a set of uh, synthetic service providers. And by service providers, I mean, they're not vendors, they're not partners, but they, they do things so that everybody and every institution in higher education doesn't do absolutely everything on its own. And I'm a big believer in autonomy. I'm a believer in uh, uh, scholarly autonomy, institutional autonomy, departmental autonomy. I mean, the, the, the creative, um, competitive, uh, fragmented, diverse, pluralistic st structure of US higher education has made the colleges and universities of this country the envy of the world for 100 years. So it's it's intense, it's competitive, it's creative, and, it, and uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. On the other hand, there is a point where um, where we shouldn't all do everything on our own, right? Like we, we uh, you know, the, uh, not every university, you know, grows its own wood to create pulp to create paper towels, right? That's pretty obvious, right? So the question is where and how should we have some collective action? How can we bring that about in, in institutional structures that as we all know, are rather change resistant. There's a lot of good to our change resistance, but it's also hard to introduce uh, um, other solutions. Um, and so that's that's really what the book's about. I'll start with like just two um, institutional anecdotes. To, to kick things off, one is TIA, now TIA, used to be TIA Gref for most of our lives. So in 1903, Andrew Carnegie, who was basically one of the three richest people in the entire world, was sitting on the Carnegie, uh, sorry, on the Cornell uh, University board and thought it was absolutely terrible how little faculty got paid, first of all. I said, you know, his clerks get paid more than faculty. Uh, and then second of all, that there was zero retirement. Uh, plan for for faculty. They basically, when they stopped working, they they had to live off of you know uh, the goodwill of, of mostly churches, right? So um, so he wanted to create a retirement fund for uh, or a retirement capacity for for faculty. So he hired um, Henry Pritchard, who was the president of MIT and engineer, uh, and created something called the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Still exists, wonderful foundation, not as uh, big and substantive as it was in 1903. So 1903 he hires Pritchett and says, I wanna create a retirement, something for a retirement plan for faculty. So in 1917, uh, TIA CREF is, it, um, is, um, uh, is created. So that's a success story, right? Like so TIA CREF, you know, which was a nonprofit until 10 or 15 years ago, tax laws changed, it's a for-profit. It doesn't have the monopoly on faculty retirement accounts that it once did. You know, some people have retirement accounts in Fidelity, Vanguard, whatever. But it was a collective solution so that every college and university in the country didn't figure out how to deal with faculty retirement. So now the two interesting things about this, one is that he, he hired Pritchett in 1903 and in 1917 is when TIA-CREF is in, uh, created. So they have 14 years where you have to figure this out because it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy because first of all, he and Pritchett didn't agree. Pritch so, so Carney thought he just could put a million dollars in and that would solve the problem. Million dollars was a lot of money then. It was not nearly enough money. And Pritchett would end up winning. He said that there have to be contributions, you know, that there have to, they can't, it wouldn't be sustainable as a charity. So already at the beginning, there's this tension between business planning and mission, um, you know, and so it took 14 years to figure out how to do that, right? 
And um, and it wasn't popular with everyone. So uh, uh, James Day, who was the chancellor of Syracuse University, was really and what one represent. He wrote to uh, Pritchett uh, at, uh, at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, and and he said um, he said you know there's no place for this fatal mildew of mindless standardization. So Syracuse didn't want to be part of this, right? And so institutions, so institutions love autonomy, departments love autonomy, faculty members love autonomy, staff who take a lot of their norms from faculty members around them love and treasure their autonomy. And as mission-driven, passionate people, their autonomy is, is you know, sometimes their personal interests that, that intervene, but for the most part, it's driven towards their definition of what the mission of the institution is. This is a great thing. It's just that it's not really great for figuring out how to, you know, sort of uh, um, identify, cross pollinate, and then um, develop and support, you know, significantly, uh, sometimes capital intensive uh, collective solutions. So that's so that TIA CREF uh, already 100 years ago that's happening. Um, just uh, to rip from today's headlines. Uh, West Virginia University just fired 178 faculty and got rid of 28 departments, right? And, and some of you may have noticed this uh, as, as a close reader of the Chronicle, uh, uh, one of the W provosts in talking about how they were gonna deal with all the languages that they got rid of said, well, we're either gonna work with the Duolingo or we're gonna maybe try to align ourselves with another university. And I'm not picking on Duolingo, I don't know them. I'm sure it's a great language program, everything like that. The idea, that the cost of higher education landed like a spaceship out of the blue on West Virginia University. They looked up one day and they realized that cost was a problem. I think we can do better than that, right? We've known for years that the cost of higher education increases more. It's a labor intensive industry. It's gonna increase faster than the rate of inflation. My TVs have gotten cheaper and cheaper over the years and better and better, right? And the cost of higher education, as you know, as we all know, there's one word that everyone uses and it's called skyrocketing, right? So, so when West Virginia is now trying to figure out what we do about language teaching, and maybe we'll use Duolingo, maybe we'll align with another university, clearly we haven't been working on collective solutions that, you know, that are needed. You know, there are, we do need collective solutions and they're not easy and they're not simple. And that's, that's basically what the book is about. How you sort of implement this kind of change how you bring it about, what the barriers are to collective action among uh, autonomous, autonomous and creative individuals and institutions, and then how you finance it, which is not simple. So some of this comes from my experience, some of it comes from the, some of these case studies, and, uh, and uh, I'm delighted to be here today, and I'm going to let Jim uh, oh. poke at me if he has questions. <laughs> sure, I do. Um, and I'm asking the questions relative from my perspective as a, chief, a senior administrator, chief financial officer at institutions. And the question that I have is vendor versus partner. You mentioned that in the book, and there's a comment that's a difference between a vendor and a partner. A vendor is interested in the bottom line since they're responsible to the shareholders. To minimize costs, vendors frequently prefer that the strategy that one size fits all. In other words, well, you can buy the system, but you can't tinker with it. It's one size fits all. Um, and that's how they approach it. A partner, however, is interested in meeting the principal needs of all their partners. And I'll give you an example of that. At the University of California, we had an issue related to effort reporting, which is part of grants and contracts. And we established a consortium of six universities um, that this is a very big issue. Each one of those would have spent money to solve it. But by working together as a consortium, along with the Office of the President, we were able to solve the problem. And what, we've, what we identified was that well, there are certain things that are common to all of us, but there are schools in the UC system that have hospitals, health sciences. We didn't want to solve all that problem for the schools that didn't have those. And so we said, you will do the basics. You can work on that part of it. So partners are interested in meeting the principal needs of all their partners. Well, partners understand the need to minimize costs. They also understand that one size does not fit all and that principal needs of, of all the partners should take precedent. Classic example is financial management systems. We went through a very painful process at Berkeley putting in PeopleSoft. Um, they promised a lot in terms of what they could deliver and they weren't able to deliver it. And so that one size required a lot of customization on the part of the university to get it to work for our grants and contracts area and for other areas of the university. So James, how would you approach this dynamic between partners and, and vendors? 
Yeah, it's it's a great topic, and uh, because I think there's there is a there's a narrow path that i'm really writing about in the book and the narrow path is on the one hand is is every campus doing everything for themselves right and inventing solutions inventing their own you know sort of uh, their own version of people soft or their own uh version of a textbook or their own library solution or their own solution to mental health student mental health issues everything doing absolutely everything on their own that's one extreme right and on the other extreme is turning over everything to the market, right? So um, there, there, there's a huge, um, I would say there's a huge investment in the end ed tech industry. Um, it, some of these things they're producing, you know, very successful companies, some are not. All, you know, big publishers like Pearson are now, in, don't call themselves publishers anymore, they're platforms. Um, they're OPMs, uh, online pro, uh, program managers like 2U. Um, their student success soft uh, programs like EAB. So there, there, there are there are some big vendors out there that um, that are willing to solve institutional problems. Right now, the, as we know, with extraction, um, <laughs> I guess I tip my hand a bit there. So if you're a big vendor and you see a two trillion dollar higher education market as a big juicy market, you're you're you know you you could just as well be a you know, a, a, an oil company trying to take oil out of the ground. And I'm not, uh, that's a, that, that may be casting more aspersions than are fair, but I basically, my, what I'm arguing for is a type of external service provider that isn't just the vendor, you know, but is a lot, is mission aligned. And, and as you say, one size doesn't fit all. That doesn't mean, again, I mean, it takes money to customize. I mean, there's a reason that PeopleSoft charge you a gazillion dollars to customize their software. Part of it is profit motive. Part of it is, you know, they just, it takes work to do it. So I think the key is to, to find, to create organizations and then financing is tricky because they're not, so some are for profit, some are no profits, but to create organizations that really are aligned to both in terms of mission and in terms of market. And that's, I actually, my, my approach to this is you actually, um, by passing a market test, you actually know that then you are a good partner to the organization. I'll just give one quick example. So from part of this book is based on experience I had building and running with colleagues an organization called Art Store that Mellon created and incubated uh, in the early 2000s when every college in the country was gonna scan their crappy slide of the Mona Lisa and thousands of other slides. And they were gonna catalog them and they were gonna have the general counsel spending their time figuring out if they could even scan them and everything like that. And we weren't brilliant people, but we knew if we gave a million dollars from the Mellon Foundation to a thousand different institutions, A, we would have spent a billion dollars and B, we'd have a thousand separate pools of content that still never talked to each other, right? And that didn't seem like a good answer. So what what we learned in going out there and i you know i came to this campus and talked to the visual resources people here and i talked to the library we couldn't just scan a slide library and say hey you know we got 300,000 slides you're all set because exactly as you say one size does not fit all and i might need a slide of the mona lisa or i might need a, a slide of a picture of a jacob lawrence painting that's in moma but i also might need a picture that i took you know coming over the bridge this morning that makes my argument it's evidence it's primary source material so what we learned was yes we could do something useful but at the same time we had to respect the the creativity and the inventiveness and the needs of the scholars on campus yeah thank you the second question relates to startup versus ongoing or recurring costs. So foundations um, like Mellon are often willing to provide one-time funds, but not funds to cover ongoing recurring costs. In your book, you cite TIA CREF as an example of a successful way of addressing pension issues for college universities. Carnegie started it with funding, but while the foundation support was essential in the startup phase, ongoing costs are covered by fees assessed to participants in the program. So when you look at doing something, there's the startup aspect. Sustaining it is really critical. And so can you comment on this? Sure. Yeah, you absolutely need a plan if you're going to take on a big project. One of the things that I used to say at Art Store was people get would get mad at us and say, wait, but Mellon started this. I mean, why isn't it free? Why are you charging the library money for this? I'm like, you want us to be charging you money. 
You want us to be charging you money because we're doing something and we're telling you not to do it. Right. And so if we disappear because we like had melon funding for five years and then they said, we're, you know, we're not going to fund you anymore. You're left high and dry. You don't have a image library. You're starting from, you know, from scratch. And so building a model from the beginning that is fair. Right. I mean, we didn't charge the same. We didn't charge, you know, Cal, the same thing that we charged St. Louis Obispo or that we charged, you know, St. Mary's of Kansas. You know, so you, you have t tiered fees, but and, and you know, so and you're not trying to exit, ex you know, create excess revenue. You're trying to cover your costs and you, you want to be clear about how you're doing it, what your model is. But the idea is that it, the, the solution has to work over the longer term, because, as you say, no, nobody's going to fund anything forever. Nobody not a foundation, not an individual donor. I mean, one of the things that we all know, if you've worked in higher education, is discontinuity happens, right? The dean leaves, the funder changes directions, and you need to have a model that works. So, so this model is really, it has to have something that is based on getting, you know, yes, we need startup capital, and yes, you know, Silicon Valley is not going to contribute it, but then you have to figure out a model that actually is viable. And sometimes it will work, sometimes it won't. Okay, very good. Thank you. The last question I have is related to the complex natures of college and university operations. So certain functions of universities lend themselves to consortiums or vendor-based solutions such as human resources, computer support, auxiliary operations such as residence hall, parking, and or food service, but other areas such as grants and contract administration, public safety advancement are more institution specific. They really vary by the scope of the institution. So how should college universities, and let me just say one other thing. One thing that's been very popular is public private partnerships. And we've engaged, this campus has engaged some of that, the campuses I've worked for have engaged in that as well. And one of the things about public private partnerships is writing the contract so that you get what you believe to be a fair return that if you're going to do residence halls, they'll build a building, they'll maintain it, but they have to maintain it and turn it over to you in good condition. So having the contract, I mean, writing, getting into the specifics is really critical. Otherwise, you'll be taken for a ride and end up with something that you really don't want that isn't sustainable. So how would you, how would you comment on that? So, you know, in many ways, what I'm writing about could be considered uh, public-private partnerships, right? It's, it's saying it, it, it's outsourcing in some version, right? It's like, we we can't do this or we shouldn't do this. We shouldn't figure out this whole solution on our own. So we're gonna go to someone else who, who can. As you point out, Jim, um, you know, some of those partnerships are uh, are very market driven, right? I mean, the, I mean, they have investors. Some of them are big capital intensive uh, projects like, you know, like, like building buildings or dining services or or other things. Um, online program managers are, you know, public private partnerships. They're saying like, we're not gonna both develop the software for, you know, for the platform, but we're also not gonna market it. So you, to you or whoever, you know, you go out there and market this master's program for us. So are their motives and the institution's motives aligned? Does one pull the other in a particular direction? I don't know if university is working with 2U, and I'm not. I, I'm again. I'm. I'm. I'll use 2U as an example of a of, of a set of uh, of for profit vendors who do this kind of work. I'm not picking on their their company in particular, but is a university that works with 2 2U to create a mass an online master's program? Are they likely to make 2U more mission driven, or is 2U more likely to make the institution more market driven. We know a lot of master's programs created that create revenue, especially online or hybrid master's programs, creating revenue that wasn't there before. It's huge surplus windfall for the institution. That's great. Money they didn't have before. Is it great? I mean, I don't know. Is it great for students? So I think, you know, things things that, you know, slow dances with the market means that you're, you're you got to be, as you say, you got to be conscious of getting what you need from it. And uh, and that those terms can evolve over time. See what you're locked into, things like that. Um, but you also have to be, you know, remember why we do these things as nonprofit institutions. Very good, thank you. And then we got some questions that were submitted prior to the um, presentation. That I'll just go over those, and I want to leave enough time for you all in the audience to ask questions as well. The first one we got was, what are the future implications of algorithms and the impact of artificial intelligence for higher education? 
<laughs> I'm glad you got the question. Actually. <laughs> if, I had, if I had a really good answer to that, I'd be over on you know on Sand Hill Road. But um, so um, no, I, I I have no expertise at all. So I, I would just say that again, when Chat GPT three landed and four landed and everyone was a buzz, it's like when COVID landed. It's the same thing. Every campus figured out everything on their own, right? When COVID landed, I mean, every dean I talked to, every administrator I walked talked to was working from seven in the morning till nine at night, you know, for, for how many, six months, you know, not just March, but getting back in the fall, every single, and what they end up with, how many different return to campus plans were there? Were there 150 or 350 or 10,000? Mm -hmm. There were probably six, right? And so figuring every, you know, whether it's AI or whether it's a pandemic, again, we're, we're not set up to do anything collectively. And so we end up having to do everything ourselves. And as you said, there are certainly things that are always going to be local and should always be entirely local. But there's some of these things that are, are you know, that there's some, there should be some shared basis. For. Okay, very good. Thank you. So the next question really is, uh, higher education is a diverse set of institutions, major research universities, community colleges. And so this question relates to what role do you see for community colleges and technical schools relative to your book? Well, so, um, you know, obviously community colleges have been much more innovative than research universities in many things, uh, in inclusive pedagogy, uh, in, you know, in uh, thinking about uh, workforce outcomes. So I, I think, you know, the 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 snobby hierarchical asymmetry of of how we structure higher education misses a lot of opportunities for those two way streets to flow you know for for those to be two way streets and so i think you know do i think there you know unfortunately you know funding for community colleges goes up and down wildly varies by state or by local uh uh district or or, or um uh system but I, you know, so I, I think that I'm sure that some of the answers for some collective efforts around cost, uh, you know, care could be driven by solutions already derived by community colleges, and you know, and they also just need the same. They they should be able to buy into the same collective solutions as others. So there there are points of similarity, um, and obviously there are points of where they where the, the the activities of the enterprise are different. Okay, we got two questions here that are similar. I'm gonna just read one of them. Um, how are we going to make sure that communities traditionally marginalized in colleges and universities are well represented in the leadership of these developments? You know what I'm asking about representation, leadership communities directly being at the table where decisions are made. So this is, how do you maintain those values that these institutions um, while going to the more synthetic model? Yeah, so I, I think this is, uh, this needs to be centered in all of these discussions particularly when we're talking about things that are closer to the heart of the academic enterprise. So like if you're talking about Workday or Oracle or whatever, I mean, those, I mean, obviously big enterprise systems like that involve staff, involve a lot of people and equity and has to be considered in, in how those things are built and how they're implemented. But when you get to the academic enterprise, it is a real danger that um, that the cost of higher education is leading us to cut back to just just the essentials, right? And so I think um, you know the liberal arts and the humanities and uh, research in general, and certainly uh, uh, progress that we've made in terms of equity and inclusion are all at risk when higher education just becomes like how how do I get a job, right? Like I mean, if if we come a place where all it is is about getting the, you know your first year, what's your first year job? Where all the things that are that are mission driven and that the university and the higher education does for this country are at huge risk. And I think so. When I talk about, I mean, I think you know, uh, in terms of um, you know, in terms of the academic enterprise, and one of the things that I write about in here, it, it, I I I I go near a third rail of talking about shared courses. I'm not talking about MOOCs because MOOCs are like one twentieth of what you need to think about shared courses. Um, but at some point, we're going to, you know, we're going to need to have some collective solutions to the heart of the enterprise and how to you know, how to do pedagogy in a way that takes advantage of this huge network of more than a million faculty that we have um, while maintaining, you know, autonomy and 
and local control, but having some shared solutions. And one of the things I write about is um, this wonderful scholar, Phil Yule, uh, who gave an address to the Society of Music Theory in, in 2017, where he basically said, you know, music theory as it is, is systematically built with a white frame based on you know late 19th century, early 20th century German theorist, one in particular, who was an avowed racist. And Schenker is like the, the, the foundation of music theory. And so Phil's work has been to say, we need to shake up. We not need to just say, oh wait, how do we get more black and, and indigenous and Latina people into music theory? We have to realize that our music theory is defined by racism. Right. And so Phil's, so this gives us an opportunity. So when we think of collective action, collective action means maybe not rebuilding the, everything that we have the way that we, we, we built it 100 years ago. Maybe we can build some fields and build some courses together that are actually you know, moving things forward. Thank you. So, well, the final question we have from the Zoom, the Zoom audience is an interesting one. The nature of education is changing. The needs of students are changing. They're looking for different ways to be marketable, to get an education, but also how can they fit into the environment? Hi hiring entities are also interested in that. So this question relates to, uh, do you have any insights regarding demography, the enrollment cliff, how some perceive future with non-traditional students transform the mission of research universities? Uh, for example, will vocational schools be more dominant if thought leaders really believe the UC will start issuing LinkedIn badges that people collect like postage stamps or something in an, un, 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 in an authenticated blockchain resume, CV for advancement toward a degree or some other new form of recognition of learning academic standing. So this was really looking at um, students have needs. They want to have a career. They know they have to be equipped for that career. Um, a lot of universities now uh, focusing in on certificates rather than the degrees and that those certificates can build towards a degree. So comment on that. Well, there are a few <laughs> questions in there. Um, <laughs> yeah, all right. I mean, I think that it has always been, it always will be, it's increasingly a part of, uh, of higher education to prepare people for careers. And that's, you know, either long-term and short-term and that's great and that's how it should be. Um, I personally don't think that you know, a liberal arts education should only be for, you know, for the elites who can afford it in a country club kind of way. I think a liberal arts education is is part of a, a huge part of preparing people for careers. So I think I think what the, the subtitle of this book is how higher education can benefit from shared solutions and save itself. What it needs to save itself from is not all the wonderful things we do. We need to save ourselves from the fact that, you know, a, a tuition and fees at at private universities, colleges are, you know, 60, 70, 80 thousand dollars. At public universities, depends on the state how much subsidy is, but subsidies are disappearing, right? They really are. So the cost of higher education is forcing everyone, all students, to think first and foremost about how am I going to pay back these loans? And how am I going to do this, right? So then we lose a lot of things along the way, including, you know, including some of the things that the market doesn't care about. I want to one question in there that I loved, which was about a blockchain resume or something like that. And, and you know, I know this much about blockchain, and uh, but I know from trying to work with university systems, as you have, that the idea that there that someone was going to like land a blockchain, you know, on the cloud, you know, shared ledger for transcripts, uh, you know, and just sort of insert that into higher education was pretty hilarious. When you think of what it takes to, you know, student record systems, I'm like, okay, you don't know what migration of legacies, I mean, it's never, it, maybe it's never going to happen, but it's certainly not going to happen as some, you know, transition like that. So. Very good. Okay. Well, I'm not going to open it to the audience and see if you have any questions for our speaker. Uh, yes. Hmm. Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for the introduction. I look forward to reading the book. Uh, my name is Igor Cherikov. I'm I work here at the Center for Studies in Higher Education. Um, um, you mentioned course sharing. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more? What are the um, what are the barriers that you see uh, for um, you know course sharing becoming? Uh, uh, a more widespread thing in higher education. And there are already course sharing consortia, but they are relatively small and kind of a niche thing. Um, and can you imagine a synthetic university that doesn't have any courses and only relies on course sharing? Yeah, thanks for that question. And in case people online didn't hear it, 
um, the question was there, you know, what are, what are the barriers to more course sharing? There is some course sharing consortium already, some that are already going on doing good things, but uh, at a pretty modest scale. And so what are the barriers to making that uh, more widely happen more widely? And, um, you know, it, it's a classic social technical problem. And, and, and as usual with social technical problems, the social part is a lot harder than the technical part. Right. So, um, so, uh, when so two things come to mind so one is you know the mooc craze right like the mooc craze of people that oh wow you know tom friedman wrote about it in the times like this is going to solve higher education we're going to share courses and as i said before you know the moocs and recorded lectures and adaptive learning they're part of it that's great that's part of it right but it's a pretty small part of it one fascinating natural experiment that happened was when uh covid landed and grades went away right did the world stop I don't think the world stopped. I think people are still being admitted to law schools and medical schools and being hired by McKinsey and stuff like that, even though for a semester there, there weren't grades, right? Because they didn't, they could handle a lot of adaption really quickly, but they couldn't figure out how to proctor grades, you know, exams and stuff like that. So I think that points to, you know, one of the big barriers to more collective courses is like, you know, what, how is that course being graded? Who's grading that? What does it mean? And, and so there, there, you know, John Mitchell over at Stanford has some really interesting ideas about ways that we could, you know, in terms of, um, uh, you know, in thinking about other modes besides, you know, letter grades to do this. So that, so things like that can provoke parts. Of other parts of it uh, are already in place in the sense of like what I was talking about with, with Phil Yule's work in music theory. We need to like think collectively about the state of the field. I mean, one of the huge barriers to faculty, um, you know, being open to change in their field is concern about loss, right? Like, I, look, I studied Renaissance literature. My PhD was on, you know, Paradise Lost, right? So I love Paradise Lost, right? And so if Paradise Lost is being taught less right now, um, and because other, you know, there are other interests, you know, do I want to, uh, you know, I, do I feel good about that? No, I, I sort of put up walls, right? Like I want people to read Paradise Lost. I think it was great. But so I think what we need in terms of the social part of social is like figuring out what, what I as a humanist want is people to study the humanities. And they may be studying, reading different texts than I read, and they may be caring about different issues, and they may, you know, uh, have different communities and different source texts that they care about and that speak to them. And we want the humanities to thrive. I've got to think a little bigger than just, you know, I need somebody to replace me who reads Paradise Lost the way I do, right? So I, I think, so that, that, um, that is a threat to autonomy. I'm just going to say it. So it, but on the other hand, what happens, the alternative is if you like let things go unresolved for long enough, what happens is like what happened to West Virginia. Like, oh, now we have a big problem. Now we're going to slash and burn. Very good. Margaret, you had a question. We'll give you a second. Uh, yeah. Oh. Uh, um, I was wondering about the pathway to the synthetic university or college. Uh, is it a lot of low hanging fruit? Uh, or are there like, do you have like three big ones that would make a big difference? And in regard to that, it seems like there's a, although it's been going back and forth, there's a big difference between kind of operational side, which Jim was alluding, versus these academic questions about, you know, shared courses or other kinds of things. But one question, is there like a couple, three or four big ones that would make a big difference? And then I'll, only a side comment would be that I assume there might be more opportunities in multi-campus systems uh, to do this kind of thing. And we, we, and Jim knows this as experience within the UC system and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't work so well. Yeah. So in any case, that's my question. So just to repeat for the online folks, two questions really. One is, are there low hanging fruit in uh, for synthetic solutions to shared problems? And the second one is, uh, do systems like the California system, uh, are they uh, a better positioned to take advantage of these things because they, they work together? So the, the first one, I would say, no. <laughs> nope, there no, there's no low hanging fruit because uh, universities, colleges and universities have squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. They're not doing anything stupid, you know, so there's not like some obvious thing. And that the, the work of forging a solution like this requires, you know, buy-in from from uh, and mission alignment uh, and so 
you know, uh, my work with Art Store, you know, did did pretty well at getting uh, people studying visual culture uh, to believe in what we did. We we had to work hard. We had a lot of melon money. It wasn't, you know, uh, you know, it, it wasn't easy. Uh, art historians are a discriminating group, um, but we worked. Uh, but but after a few years. Uh, 2000 institutions were subscribing. They saw what was in it for them. Then we tried to expand. We said, hey, we want to do uh, software for campuses to manage their own image files, not in art history, but in cell biology or in dentistry or whatever. And it was good. And we knew a lot about images, and everything like that. Didn't work. Didn't work because we didn't have because it was too big a brief. It wasn't so. So these these solutions have to be pretty. Like I mean, I write about the National Student Clearinghouse, which ties together three thousand registrars from all over the country. An incredible organization. If they if they started off and said, "Hey, we're going to work with admissions offices, we're going to work with alumni offices," they would have been chased out of town, right? So it's so so not a lot of low hanging fruit, just a lot of work. Second question is: uh, Do systems that already work together uh, the, are they better positioned for this? Um, Maybe a controversial thing I'm going to say here. I don't really believe in collaboration. I, I do personally. I just think that collaboration between institutions who compete day in and day out for absolutely everything. They compete for faculty. They compete for staff. They compete for grants. They compete for public attention. You know, then saying, hey, let's all work together. It doesn't happen. So this that's why this mode I, I advocate for, hard as it is, it says, look, you've really... It, you know, it's a, it's both got to be uh, mission aligned, but it's also to pass a market test. It's got to say this solution is good enough that that you want to write a check for it because we're not going to depend on places all play nicey nicey together. Can I just comment on this as well? Just to add to this, and it's from the administrative perspective, low hanging fruit, computing system, security, all of that. Um, a lot of schools are doing that. Smaller schools are understanding that to maintain duplication of security systems and computer systems, et cetera, is very expensive. They can do a joint effort. You can reduce costs overall. The other area that is human resources, personnel, human resources. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be done online um, that'll work and also some things that would free up human resource staff to deal with other issues. So you use systems for triage for those basic things. Uh, and then that frees up staff within human resources to deal with the more complicated things. The other thing I'd mention is that having been in several systems, Maryland and California, uh, there is this competition back and forth. The effort reporting thing that I mentioned was that was a, an interest of like six campuses that had this as a need and we're going to do their own system. But working together, they got an inexpensive solution. The other thing is consortiums in Rhode Island. I did a book on pension reform. And uh, those schools got together and by a group, by a consortium group, they could do something that each individual school couldn't do on their own. So there is still some opportunities there. Public-private partnerships get a lot of attention, but there are other areas where you look where you've got a very high cost, like technology, which is becoming more and more expensive, um, that are still available for not only the big universities, but also small and community colleges. Okay, we had a question back here. Yes, I have to go in just a moment, but before I leave, I wanted to ask, <clears throat> when uh, we talk about shared solutions in universities, uh, uh, conversation often turns to something that you haven't mentioned, and I wondered what your take is on it. Where uh, is the AAU, the RU uh, organization of university presidents, uh, where are their efforts to come up with shared solutions for American higher education in, in your analysis? Yeah, so uh, so the question was, um, when we think about shared solutions, where are groups like the AAU that, uh, you know, the 80, 86, so I mean, 91 now, largest research universities, are they, are they interested in this? Um, my view is generally that uh, college presidents, for the most part, get uh, chosen and rewarded based on their uh, uh, capacity to distinguish the university in terms of rankings, in terms of getting into the AAU and things like that, they're not rewarded for collaboration, right? And so, and they're not rewarded for things that um, that are cost-effective. I mean, Larry Backow, former president of Harvard said this beautifully. He said, you know, look at what we brag about. We brag about faculty to student ratio. We, we brag about how inefficient we are in our teaching. And uh, Larry is a great scholar and believer in teaching, right? So, um, I think that um, boards and um, and presidents, but you know, 
presidents follow the you know follow you know the bell. Um, I have to understand that the the unsustainable path that we're on, and everyone knows it's unsustainable. I don't I don't work with I work with deans and faculty and the provosts all the time, and none of them are saying, oh, it's not a problem. The cost of higher education, it's not a problem. They all know it's a problem. But we but the 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 system is sort of insidiously to, you know created to keep everybody running on the treadmills that they're running. So we definitely need. Um, you know, I, 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 I hate to say it's got to get worse before it's going to get better, but the cost problem has to be recognized as a problem uh, in a way that is real rather than just chatter before presidents start to do more about it. Yeah, let me comment on that. I've worked at five AEU institutions across the country, and he, uh, James is absolutely right. It's all about rankings. It's all about prestige. It's all about donor relations, et cetera. Having said that, though, certain AEU campuses um, have done a lot of things in terms of collaborations. A new AEU campus is Arizona State University, yeah. which is a point this year. And Arizona State is cited in your book as getting groups of entrepreneurs together with university people to try to develop solutions. So on their own, universities can be very effective, but AEU is not really designed that way, at least my perception. It might be helpful to remember that a number of the leaders of the AAU for the last 75 years uh, like Clark Kerr and Nathan Pusey and a lot of other people have taken on the problems of higher education in a synthetic manner and have tried yes. to argue what solutions are for all universities. These people, as I understand their careers, have interacted very considerably among themselves. The question would be, why is that leadership not present now? Surely it has been in the past and when Bob Rosenzweig was the executive director of the AAU, there were a series of uh, leadership comments all the time about what was going on in higher education. So I really do not buy the analysis at all, but it's just a matter of these people going off in their own way. Well, I think that what I'd comment on that is that um, you're right. In fact, the former chancellor of Berkeley was the head of AAU for a few years as well, Bob Burdall. Um, those folks, uh, those campuses have done remarkable things and have been innovators from the very beginning. And they've done it by working with other AAU campuses, but not through the AAU is what I'm saying is AAU. AAU does have one thing that's been valuable, the AAU data exchange. Now, the AAU data exchange collects information that's not available in iPads or other sources, but it's restricted to only AAU members. So they do do that. That's very valuable. In fact, I've used that at University of Washington, Maryland, Berkeley, et cetera. But it's not available to the general, the, the vast bulk of institutions. It's only available to those members. But I agree with you totally that the presidents, uh, folks that have been in charge of AU have done remarkable work, Clark Kerr, absolutely, uh, on their own, working with other AU campuses and others as well. But the association itself I don't de de degrade AAU because it's a, you know, but it's it's just not been that effective in that area. Okay. Other questions? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I have a number of uh, responses, and I think they may come over as somewhat half baked because I don't think about governance a great deal but I do think much more about the academic community. And one of the things I've observed is um, with the outsourcing of various services, for instance, the latest affront is Google is becoming so expensive that alumni can no longer retain their Berkeley EDU email. Well, this is causing great distress because for many of the graduates of this institution, that is how they wish to be identified evermore. That's part of why they came here. So that's leading to disgruntlement. Another issue is the bookstore. Um, Paulette has been managing what's, uh, we couldn't call it a bookstore anymore. It's a merchandising depot. Right. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. And if I want a book on higher education, I trot on down to Stanford because they have a great bookstore. Yeah. <laughs> but my point is, um, you've raised a lot of ideas um, which aren't, I'm, you might say, almost a consumer as well as an analyst of higher education. I find the way in which HR now works has lost the fact that you're dealing with people who have been on the campus for a long time and may have some issues, and yet there's no 
computer because it's now a paradigm which has been developed about outsourcing in which um, the individual client, not the university as a client, I think is being lost. <clears throat> and I find this a deeply disturbing trend. And I know this is a lot, but this is part of the stimulation of your talk. I mean, you are talking about a paradigm change and how you're going to go with this new paradigm of making universities cost efficient. At the same time, it's a paradigm switch for inclusion. And um, one of the things that puzzles me about <clears throat> this high level paradigm shift, which isn't referencing sort of, we may call ourselves the lower level who are being influenced by this. And there doesn't seem to be, despite the faculty committees and the academic senate, there doesn't seem to be the inclusion of faculty, um, particularly in these shifts. And yes, we know it's fashionable. I know, I apologize, I'm sort of running on, but you're to blame because you had so many ideas. <laughs> um, I'll take it. <laughs> um, well, I'll stop there. But I mean, even Jim's reference to Arizona State. Arizona State came up with all kinds of novel ways of teaching its undergraduates, bringing students in, right. um, certifying them. So we're not surprised that Arizona State has pulled its socks up because that is truly an entrepreneurial university, I would say. Um, but you know what might fit Arizona doesn't transfer so well. Mm -hmm. So um, let me uh, try to recap the question. A lot. Uh, no, but there's, there's good questions there. So one question was, uh, you say, uh, Google providing email service and people losing, you know, the, the cost going up over time probably started off costing nothing, right? And then it ended up and now people are losing their Berkeley EDU uh, email address. The bookstore is, as you say, now a merchandise depot rather than a bookstore. Um, and so then your question was, um, I'm, am I advocating for a paradigm shift that could, goes more in this direction, right? Okay. So um, I think those, the, those first two are great examples. I think that's, I think I alluded earlier, you, you let the market in, the market rules are going to happen. And, you know, and, and Google is not here to uh, serve the mission of a university, right? So, and to think of the alumni and to think of the symbolic role that this plays in their lives, right? They're there to make money, right? So, and, and uh, just back to my image service thing, when I was doing art store and it was mission driven, um, even though we charge fees, people, some people said, well, I can just use Flickr. Do people in this even room even know what Flickr is? Flickr is like gone now because Flickr got bought by Yahoo and then Yahoo bought it. So it got Yahoo and people know what Yahoo is. I mean, so, so you place things that matter to you, things about the academic enterprise in the trust of public companies and you get what you deserve. So I think I completely agree. And the bookstore is a great example. Imagine if the bookstore, you know, that got Barnes and Noble and first and then whoever the vendor is here, if all of our collective bookstores had been set up by a mission driven organization and we had all put capital in it in universities and funders or whatever, and then a bookstore could have uh, been with the goal of breaking even rather than profit making and maybe we'd be in a different place. And so am I pointing to a paradigm shift? I'm not advocating for a paradigm shift at all. I, I, I'm a big believer in studying paradigm shifts. This is not one. This is very modest, gradual, bottom-up, bought-in change, right? And that's how it has to happen. One of the cases in my book is a, is a group of classicists uh, at liberal arts colleges in the South who did heroic work working together. Uh, Kenny, um, Kenny Morrell at, uh, at Rhodes College and people at 27 other liberal arts colleges said, we can be better if we work together. We can have, I teach Aristophanes, you teach Roman architecture. Why am I teaching Roman architecture rather than, and you're teaching, you know, Greek comedy. So at your school, because we're not working together. So what can they do together? They can solve, they can cover each other on sabbatical leaves, which they couldn't take because, you know, they, they one, one member of small department, right? So I, 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 to me, there's not paradigm shift at all. It's about doing things collectively that are, you know, obviously you need to be supported up top and need to have a, a, a viable business plan that is effective, but that they're mission preserving. So that means working with the people who know what's going on. 
Okay, we have time for one last question. And Margaret, you've had your hand up several times. Why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Well, my question has to do with the difference between the university uh, universities in the United States versus universities in countries where it's completely free. If you take something like Germany, now it's true, US universities, some of them are certainly classified as the best in the world, but I'm curious, is it a big cultural difference, a difference in government? What, what makes such a big difference in all those countries, such as the Netherlands and France and, well, and even now many third world countries, they are raising their their higher ed, so it will be completely free. And in Germany, it's not only free for residents, it's free for international students as well. What, what do you see as the biggest difference? They pay taxes. They pay taxes. They, they pay taxes that subsidize the same work as the universities. Universities are structured differently. They're, you know, they're research institutes separate from the from the undergraduate university. They're specialized. But the big difference is the subvention comes from the government. The government has money because their tax rates are much higher. Uh, and that comes because the culturally the communities are willing to support that. And we're not. So yeah, let me comment on that a little bit. Uh, when you say that um, education in the UK is not free. There used to be the grants committee. They used to give yes. money to different universities. When the yes. economy went bad, those schools started to raise tuition and fees to try to generate money. So it's not universally that we're the only ones that do this. And the same is true of Japan. We had visitors from Japan cross and say, yes. how can we get additional funds? The other thing that's interesting, though, is that there are online universities. There's a university now called the University of the People, and it charges very low fees, um, and what it does, it does everything online and it relies on two sources uh -huh. of income, donations, I people see. giving it. They are the largest provider of higher education to folks in refugee camps who can't afford it. A large number of their students. So there are other models that will work. And this is an online institution that's worldwide. So, I mean, I share your concern. There are models that work, but that's a very different education, right? Well, it's a different education, and what the, what they do, though, they basically provide the basic fundamentals that are necessary for somebody to enter a higher education institution. They do award degrees; they award both undergraduate and gra and graduate program degrees. Yes. So yes. they're they're a hybrid model. What's interesting about them, though, is the ability to offer these to people that are disenfranchised, people that are refugees, can can go online and get this. Their model also includes faculty not from America or Britain; it's faculty from India. And faculty from the Arabian countries. Uh -huh. so, so. Yeah, I just I don't want to leave people with the impression that we could just go all online and and oh. solve the inequities. I mean, I think yeah, I think Margaret's point is that there are great universities in other parts of the country, the mm -hmm. world where the fees are much lower or not. Yes. And I think you're right; those countries are moving towards what they call the American model. So the American model means the the burden falls on students and families. And so I think. Uh, this is a place where, um, you know, we do have great institutions and we do have a great and highly competitive, competitive and diversified model, but it definitely does not have public support. And if it did, that would be great. I mean, I, I, I'd be all in favor of like not trying to, you know, you know, fiddle with anything, you know, that institutions do on their own if there was endless subsidy, but yeah. uh -huh. there is. Uh, let me just correct that. I don't believe online education is a panacea for higher education. It's not, yeah. okay? I, I'm more in favor of a hybrid model for that uh, that works, I think, effectively. But for certain disenfranchised individuals, which we should be all concerned about, having that available to them is very valuable. If it leads to them going to a more established university or whatever, that's a window of opportunity that we need Absolutely. to provide. So, but But online education is not a panacea. It's an integral part of how we deliver education now. Um, and it depends on the kind of institution you are. I mean, for a long time before the pandemic, Berkeley did not have a strong online presence at all. ASU did, but we didn't, okay? Then with the, pan then with the pandemic, we got everybody went online, um, but I think Berkeley still needs to do an awful lot to get it to be much more um, interactive um, as well. So some schools were early adopters, some schools, we're not, 
that interested. So, but and, it's not a panacea. I totally. And agree. some universities like Georgia Tech and MIT are doing very innovative work with online. They are, and they're doing it in selective programs in yes, Georgia Tech and very engineering. Selective. Um, and some schools do really good programs. In fact, with the pandem pandemic, nursing, which should always be hands on. Uh -huh. They were able to do a lot of that online uh -huh. because there uh -huh. wasn't available to get the facilities. But yeah, no, there are other schools that are doing that. I just think Berkeley, speaking as Berkeley person, I think we could we could do more. Great. We could do more. Well, okay. thank you all thank very you. much for those in person and those online. It's uh, it's it's great to be here. I'm really honored and uh, thrilled to be at a great center at a great university talking about this. I really appreciate the, the and questions and the dialogue. And thank you, Jim and James, very much. Goodbye. Thank you. James squared, right? <laughs> okay, thank you very much.